Uh, this is the 26th annual Environmental Studies um, Symposium, which is on the theme of life within capitalism, reconsidering market consequences and the earth system. And uh, we have had two wonderful events this far. The first event was a game in which players emulated the roles of power companies and practiced trading carbon offsets on the market. Addressing the question, can a market be designed to solve the problems that it largely created? Last night, we met here for the, come on in, grab a seat, here for the keynote presentations, and we addressed a deep question, can the current economic system provide for the global good? And we explored different ways that capitalism expresses itself in different places and different times and the essential relationship between an economic system and the government that has the ability to regulate it and uh, provide for social services and how those two get very mixed up. So tonight, we have something different yet related. I uh, will hand it over to our student co-chairs to describe more about the panel. And so may I first ask the planning committee to come on up. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, so we are the committee these three are not the committee, they're the co-chairs. <laughs> We're kind of all mixed in up here. Um, so us as the committee just wanted to take a moment to put our, all of our attention on the co-chairs. Um, Kaylee, Grace, and Julia are so incredibly driven and passionate. Um, they have put countless hours into all of the events and you can really tell how much time they've put in. Um, where was I? Um, we just wanted to express how incredibly honored we are that we got to work with you guys this semester. Um, and we wanted to say that we're so proud of you and all the work that you guys have done. And we just wanted to say thank you. So we have some flowers. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to cry while I read this introduction. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, now for the panel. So I am very happy to introduce Micah Miro. Um, Micah began her career in international development with a small microfinance NGO in Oaxaca, Mexico, supporting female entrepreneurs as they started and grew their businesses. Upon returning to the US, she connected with Green Empowerment an internationally focused nonprofit that supports local leaders all across the globe as they spearhead renewable energy and clean water infrastructure in their own communities. After receiving her BA in modern dance from Mills College, Micah spent her early career as an art teacher and program manager. Today, she uses her creative talents to tell global stories as Green Empowerment's engagement manager. I personally had the privilege of working with her this past summer, and I know she has a uniquely global perspective on the topic of rene renewable energy and community-driven solutions to the climate crisis. It is our honor to welcome Micah to the panel. I would like to introduce Susan Bladholm, who is the founder and president of Frog Ferry, a nonprofit grassroots organization that aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, build community resilience, and foster economic development with a focus on connecting under underdeserved communities to jobs and healthcare. The Frog Ferry Passenger Ferry Initiative aims to activate the riverways and waterfronts of Portland for the benefit of individuals commuters, visitors, and downtown employers alike. Susan acts as a catalyst to green transportation in the Portland metro area. 
I had the privilege of meeting Susan last fall through a Global PDX event on climate disruptors and follow alongside the triumphs she has made in the last year with Frog Ferry. It is our honor to welcome her tonight to our panel discussion. I would like to introduce, oh, I'm happy to introduce Olivia Cowley, a 2023 Lewis and Clark alum. She wrote her senior thesis on deep seabed mining and its implications for the stakeholders involved, highlighting its cultural, economic, and ecological impact on indigenous Pacific Islanders. The title of her thesis is, Is the Future Electric? What the Renewable Energy Revolution Means for the Ocean Seabeds. Ms. Cowley's nuanced research on the connections between renewable energy and deep seabed mining highlights the interconnectedness between our natural and social systems. Having double majored in international affairs and environmental studies, Olivia is currently working towards a career in environmental law and offers a relatable position as she is amidst the academic world. Please give Olivia a warm welcome back as thanks for being here with us tonight. Hi everyone. Um, I get to introduce Joe Wachunas. Thank you for being here with us today as one of our four panelists. Mr. Wachunas is currently working at the New Buildings Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to decarbonizing water heating through heat pump heaters. Living in an all electric net zero energy home himself, Mr. Wachunas believes that electrifying anything from transportation to homes is the quickest path to an equitable, clean energy future. Along with previously working on electric school buses and vehicle to grid charging at Forth, he is currently volunteering at the organization Electrify Now, and it sits and sits on the board of Pace Ghana. Mr. Wachunas's experience with the renewable energy sector and his personal investment in individual decarbonization reflects his belief that decarbonizing your life is one of the most important steps to ensuring a more just and sustainable future. We are grateful to have Mr. Wachunas here to discuss his pragmatic implementation of these concepts. It is my pleasure to introduce Yuko Aoama, our, one of our keynote presenters and our panel discussion facilitator here tonight. Professor Aoama is an economic industrial geographer with expertise on globalization, technological innovation, industrial organization, and cultural economy. Her research focuses on the way that global capitalisms function and maintain economic distinctiveness throughout geographically various locations, such as the US, Japan, India, and Ch Spain. <laughs> On top of all of this, Professor, Clark, Professor Aoama teaches at Clark University, including courses on globalization and economic geography. On top of all this, <laughs> sorry, throughout planning our symposium, we really wanted to emphasize how important it is to maintain a wide lens, to really reflect the importance of understanding other people and places to start to understand our own issues and our own systems. We were particularly drawn to Professor Aoama's ability to illuminate connections and complexities about global capitalisms, economies, and the social implications of these systems. This is particularly evident in her new book, The Rise of the Hybrid Domain, Collaborative Governments for Social Innovation. Let's please all have a big round of applause for Yuko being here with us tonight again. Thank you very much. Is this on? Yes, it is on. Thank you very much. So today, my role is a moderator role, which means I'm going to be keeping the time 
and making sure that uh, we get to hear from each of our panel speakers representing four different themes. So I'm going to start off with the first question. We have four or five questions that we'd like to pose to the panelists. And we are going to go in sequence, I believe. Well, I'll start with Susan for the first question. And after the, uh, after the four or five questions, what we'd like to do is to open up the conversation to the floor. So be prepared to ask questions, the things that you're dying to know from the panelists. And after we're done with the questions, we're going to ask Clarence um, Edwards to come to the podium and give us a concluding remark. So that's the structure of the, uh, of the, uh, the panel session today. OK, so let me start with the first question, which is really asking each of you to introduce yourself and introduce your work in the broader, bigger picture context of renewal energy transition. Okay, can you start here from Susan? Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Is this on? We're hot? Great, I really appreciate being here. So for Frog Ferry, this is, you know, really something that was born out of curiosity. Going back seven years ago or so, I was just curious, um, I've been a student pilot and flying around the region and seeing uh, the choke points of congestion on I-5 and through the Rose Quarter and particularly over the I-5 bridge and just wondering why aren't we using our river systems? And as I've traveled to other river cities really around the world, seeing their river transit system and also the advent of electrified vessels on the water. So I just did some research. I took a Saturday and just did a research. I'm a, a big believer, and especially as I look out at this auditorium to you and your generation, you know, this is really, for me, um, a telling moment of who else is going to solve the climate crisis. And I really had to take a hard look at myself and say, I want to be part of the solution. And I've got kids that are 24 and 29, and I just feel an enormous responsibility to try to figure out a way to um, get us on a better path. So I did the research. I took it out to four big public agencies, um, ODOT, the Oregon Department of Transportation, PBOT, the Portland Department of Transportation, TriMet, which is our regional council of governments, and Metro, which is our regional planning agency. And they all said, we really like this plan. We think it has merit. We can't take it on. We don't have the capacity or the money. We think you need to do this. Well, guess what? No one here in Portland has started a passenger ferry service in about 100 years. So um, doing a little bit more research and looking at 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions, pretty much on the whole, but particularly in the U.S., are caused by transportation. And even if you look at the maritime industry, it's about 3% in, in general and uh, globally. Um, however, I also did some research and realized the electrified ferry market is progressing so quickly that there are now conferences around the globe just for electrified ferries. And definitely Europe is far ahead of us and even looking at like Brisbane is probably the model that's most closely aligned to what we have in Portland with the Willamette River. They've got a fairly narrow, fairly fast moving river, tidal fluctuations of about 26 feet and low bridge clearance. And, um, and then looking at London and the, the Tim's Clipper service as well. And, um, and realizing this can be done here. Um, the electrification can be done here. And even though Governor Inslee in Washington State is quite a ways ahead of us with Washington Maritime Blue, and Oregon really hasn't launched a great um, water-based, um, and I'd say energy policy, we're, we're 
we're pretty far behind. I know you're from Seattle, but um, there are a small, there's a small network of ours that we're trying to move forward with electrification. One of them is with Photon Marine building electric outboard motors. Uh, given that about 25% of all diesel engines around the world, that diesel's spilling into our waterways around the world, particularly in underdeveloped and underserved communities. So, so that's my motivation, or people like you. Um, I s truly believe, like Joe, that electrification is the way to go. I don't think it's perfect, but I think given the climate crisis, better is better. And we need to move to better and transition people out of cars. And I think the last thing I would say is I think this is much bigger than a passenger ferry service. Right now, for the communities we're serving, you've got upwards of 87 even 87 percent of the population in the North Peninsula up by St. John's and North Portland are driving single occupancy vehicles to commute to work. So I think that we can just be a really great case study to get people considering how how they are looking at mobility around the region and to make smarter and more thoughtful transit decisions. Hello, thank you all for welcoming back to Lewis and Clark. It feels like I haven't even left at this point. Um, I'm incredibly humbled to be on this panel today with these with these three experts who truly know know what they're doing in their field. And I'm coming out of a couple months of research, so I really appreciate them them having me here. Uh, my work for my senior environmental studies thesis, as uh, was mentioned earlier, was on deep seabed mining. Um, in connection with renewable energy and the transition to using clean energy, we need metals, uh, particularly for electric vehicle batteries and for solar panels. In order to, to supply those, we need critical metals, uh, cobalt, nickel, copper, manganese, lithium. And deep seabed mining offers an opportunity to extract some of these metals uh, from, the, from the ocean floor. And so proponents of, of this extraction look, look to the renewable energy market and say, hey, we're going to need metals. Our market is increasing two to six folds. Um, we are looking to electrify entire, entire passenger fleets um, and ferries at some point as well. And so how, how can we do this? Our terrestrial reserves are fast depleting. And so what, what haven't we touched? Of course, uh, we've turned to the oceans. And so a highly controversial issue that brings in environmental challenges as well as uh, social challenges as well, conflicts with indigenous people, Specifically, my work uh, was investigating the Pacific island of Nauru in, um, in the South Pacific. And so putting that into to conversation with what these other experts have to say is what, where are we going to get these metals if we were going to go down the, the decarbonized route? And are we going to, to mine the deep sea? So happy to get into that more as we progress, but we'll pass it on to Micah to ex explain, explain what she does. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Ooh, I'm loud. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I work with Green Empowerment. I am their engagement manager. I'd love to just see a quick show of hands. How many people here already know about Green Empowerment? Yeah! <laughs> we have a lot of connections to Lewis and Clark, so I was wondering if that would be the case. We are a nonprofit based here in Portland, Oregon, um, but we do work internationally. And as Julia shared, our work is focused on renewable energy and clean water infrastructure. Um, and we are doing that work with rural and indigenous communities around the globe. The way we approach this work is really important to us. So it is really through partnership and community engagement. So I'll talk on that just for a minute. Partnership meaning that in all of our projects around the globe, we partner with an in-country organization that knows the local language, knows the local culture, and has a long-term stake in that region, a long-term commitment to that region. And then 
when I say community involvement, I mean that the people who are going to use the infrastructure are involved in making decisions about what the infrastructure will look like, in actually physically building the infrastructure, and then they're really on board for the long-term maintenance plans, because it is them who will do the long-term maintenance and repairs of the systems. Um, so to give you a picture of what this really looks like, for our conversation tonight, I want to focus in on one project that we just completed in Malaysian Borneo in a community called Long Tanid. Um, this is on the island of Borneo. It's an uh, indigenous community in a very biodiverse rainforest there. Um, when we first started working with the community, with our partner there, which is Tony Bung, a local organization who has been doing this work also for decades, um, the community long to need, the only energy access they had was through diesel generators. So community members would have about four hours of, of electricity a day from their diesel generators um, with bad health outcomes, also of course pretty bad for the environment, and also a very time consuming way to get energy. In this case, the closest place to fill their diesel tanks was four hours away on a very rough dirt road. So that was the next biggest town where actually diesel was sold. So we worked with this community with Tony Bung throughout the last year. They built their own micro hydro system. So this is a energy technology where it's it's really just what it sounds like. You divert a bit of water from a stream and you send that water downhill to get the gravity power to turn a turbine. And then the water gets sent back into the stream. So there is no dam and it has a very low environmental impact. Um, but that does generate enough energy to power, in this case, um, to bring 24-hour electricity access to all 50 houses in the community and the local primary school. So now in Long Tanid, um, today as we speak, <laughs> actually they're sleeping, <laughs> they're just waking up, they're just waking up in Long Tanid right now, <laughs> but they do have 24 hour access, energy access there now. Um, they're not doing that dry, they have the time savings, they have a significant economic savings from not having to buy diesel. In addition, the project has displaced about a thousand liters of diesel a month that they were using previously. And as part of the project, the community um, agreed, signed a commitment to preserve 1,300 acres of rainforest within their watershed. So Long Tanid is emblematic of many of the communities that we work with in that it is in a very biodiverse region, also emblematic in that it is close to the equator and it is feeling in an extreme way the effects of climate change. So I would say these communities are small, but they are extremely vulnerable to climate change. They are also crucial leaders in protecting the biodiverse regions of our world that we have left. Um, so magnify that impact through the other projects we're doing with Tony Bung and through 24 partners that we're working with in 13 countries around the world. Um, and that's the work that Green Empowerment does. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Joe Wachunas. Great to be here tonight. Thanks for uh, organizing uh, this and having us all here. I, I see a lot uh, of I, solutions uh, in the panel tonight. I mean, we're facing the, uh, the climate crisis every summer. We're seeing scarier, never before seen weather. And some of the, uh, what the panelists up here tonight represent uh, from electrified transportation to sustainably harvesting materials to renewable energy and then uh, electrification of buildings are some of the key answers that we need to solve the climate crisis. Um, I, I work for a nonprofit called New Buildings Institute uh, that is trying to decarbonize and electrify buildings. And um, there, I, I don't know if uh, folks here are following this electrification movement, uh, but it seems to be one of our clearest paths out of this mess. We, if we electrify all the systems in our lives, anything that uh, heats our water or powers our ferries or vehicles, uh, and power that with renewable energy like microhydro or solar or wind, we can reduce our carbon emissions and we can do it really quickly. So it's a hopeful message. And this is different than uh, the message of the 1970s, which was do, you know, use less. Now it's stop burning things. 
and, uh, and, and we can do it through heat pumps and uh, EVs and solar energy. So it's a hopeful message, and it's an, an, a message that can empower individuals. Uh, but how do we make that equitable? How do we make our transition equitable uh, is a big question. So excited about today's conversation, and thanks for having me here. Very much. So now we have the introduction. Uh, I'd like to ask the panelists the following question. And the question has to do with constraints and incentives. So what kind of constraints do you face in your work? Uh, where do they come from? Do they come from the private sector? Do they come from the state? And can you address a little bit about what kind of incentive structures do you already have that you take advantage of, or do you think that you need to have in your area? And if you could do that somewhat succinctly in the next two, three minutes each, that would be really wonderful. Joe, do you want to go first and then come this way this time? OK. Um, the hardest thing is to talk succinctly, so I'm going to look at my clock here. Um, that, that's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, what are some of the constraints? And all, I think all the technologies uh, that we'll talk about tonight are uh, on various stages of adoption. Uh, I don't know if you all have seen, there's this S-curve of adoption. The technologies start with like the early adopters and then gain momentum and then become the majority and then they just zoom up. And so we're seeing that in a, uh, play out in really fascinating ways uh, with electric vehicles and electric transportation. You know, we've gone from 1% a couple years ago to 10% uh, in the first half of this year. Um, so in, in my industry of heat pump and, and heat pump water heaters, oh, by the way, any, has anyone heard of a heat pump water heater before? Raise your hand. A couple, <laughs> a couple folks in the back. Um, not the most exciting technology, but important for decarbonization. Um, we're in the uh, for heat pump water here specifically, we're in the early adopter phase. We're at like 2%. So incentives are really important. And luckily, I don't know if you all have been tracking, but last year, a major piece of legislation was passed, the Inflation Reduction Act. And this provides, uh, uh, it does many things, but it provides tax credits for electrification technologies. Uh, that, that means electric vehicles, um, electric heat pumps, uh, electric heat pump water heaters, induction stoves. All these electric technologies we need to um, electrify the future and decarbonize. So incentives are really key until uh, you really have that market takeoff. And uh, luckily, we do live in a time with incentives and rebates that will help move the market forward. Awesome. Thanks. Is this loud enough? OK. Mic distance. Um, yeah, I'm excited by the way you framed the question. Uh, something I love about working with Green Empowerment is that the kind of natural incentive is very clear in the communities that we work in. Um, in Long Tanid that I was talking about, you know, I said as part of the project they sign an agreement to protect um, an area of their watershed. And that is really um, consistent across our projects, not necessarily the signing of it, but the working on protecting the watershed because in these systems, whether they be energy systems or water systems, they are very dependent on the watershed staying healthy, right? So in a microhydro system, that stream has to keep running. It has to keep having water in it for that turbine to keep turning, for that energy to come to the homes, right? So the people in that community have this very immediate incentive to make sure that their hillsides are not logged, to make sure that they are preserving that area Otherwise, the energy will not come to their homes. And this is the kind of global incentive that we all have to take care of the earth. In, uh, but it's, very, it's hard to feel that living in a city, living in a very developed nation where um, our systems for getting resources are so removed from us. So I'd say that is kind of one of the benefits of working small scale, as you can see the natural incentives um, built into the projects. And then um, one of the constraints that we work with across our programs, as I mentioned, we work in 13 different countries. Um, so we're working with a, within a lot of different government systems and a lot of different regulatory environments. And it does really matter a lot how much the government wants to be involved. In an ideal world, the government is helping build the utilities um, for 
all sizes of communities, but in the real world, that is often not happening in, for various reasons in various places. So even if they're not gonna be able to build, help build those utilities, creating an environment, a regulatory environment, where um, small off-grid systems are incentivized, are supported. For us, where community-owned systems are allowed even and supported is very important. So I wanted to share one of the ways that we are addressing that. Um, again, building off the example of Long Tanid, with that same partner, Tony Bung, We've actually been working with them for 20 years and with some other partners in Malaysia as well for 20 years. And we've now formed a consortium with us and three other partners. So there's four of us in the consortium. And this was about two and a half years ago that we formed the consortium. It's called the Saba Energy Roadmap. And it's specifically to work with the state of Saba to put microgrids and off-grid energy systems and renewable energy systems into their state energy plans and to rewrite their regulations so that it is supportive of this kind of development. Um, it's been really exciting work. Our initial goal was to map the entire state of Saba and find all of the villages that were unelectrified. We've done that. Um, it's a little over 400 villages. Um, and the mapping is really cool. You can go on the website and look at different layers of maps and see um, you know, what, where the communities are, see where the roads are, see what kind of renewable energy would work best for those communities and for what reasons. Um, so that is something that the government and the larger investors can use to make decisions on a, on a bigger scale about how to deploy energy. And now we've pivoted, um, and our next goal as a consortium is really to implement. How can we actually get these villages um, electrified? So this is where it comes to working with government, working on a bigger, working, working with government in order to be able to scale our work. So, you know, as a small nonprofit, we've worked with our partners in Malaysian Borneo to build 31 really cool microhydro systems over the last 20 years. Um, with this consortium, our goal is to build, is to electrify 200 villages over the next 10 years. So that's really the difference that um, working with, with government and with larger agencies can make as far as meeting the actual need that is out there. All right, maybe in contrast to the hopeful message from Joe and Micah, um, a lot of I mean, probably a more cynical perspective as well is within deep seabed mining, one of the major incentives is money, right? There's capital gains within the metal market, although highly volatile. Like I mentioned earlier, the world, the world needs metals, and especially if we're going down this renewable path, we're going to need to find a way to get them. My case study was looking at the small country of Nauru and their multinational corporation partner, which is the metals company. They're from Canada. And they, those two, those in partnership are pushing the world closer and closer to deep seabed mining. So it has yet to happen yet. Uh, regulations uh, in order to continue with mining and formally conduct these, these extractive procedures have not yet happened. Um, but we can already investigate some of the environmental and social challenges of that. Um, and so looking at the economic incentives, the metals company is set to, predicted to make between six and $10 billion over this, this one project in partnership with Nauru. Um, by contrast, Nauru may make just 720 million, um, although, that for a small country that can do more than what it can in the U.S., but it's it's not nearly enough for them to stabilize their economy. Um, and so, quite a cynical way, it it is it is money. We we do need these metals. Um, we do want to find a way to to decarbonize and to electrify our systems. Um, but I from from a lot of my research that seemed to be from a, a very large push that way. Um, in terms of some of these constraints. Um, looking at it from an, a government standpoint, similar to, to what Micah mentioned, was this takes a lot of collaboration across, across governments and is really reliant on international law that is, quite frankly, very ineffective. Uh, and so trying to 
trying to put up this entire regulatory system for an industry that has yet to be explored and an area that we know less about than we do about the surface of the moon um, is, is quite a constraint. Um, and so on top of that, looking at um, other government constraints is, is conflict with indigenous indigenous needs and indigenous wants as well. There was a failed deep seabed mining project off of the coast of Papua New Guinea. And largely that opposition came from uh, indigenous indigenous people in the area, as well as fishermen who relied on that on that sea for, for their sustenance and for and for their economy. And so we're we're seeing this this conflict between between governments and social needs, um, as well as the influence of major corporations, kind of combating that. Okay, use your imaginations. It's five years from now. You've graduated. You got a job around the downtown Portland area, and you're living in North Portland. That's where housing's a bit more affordable. They've recently re kind of district the waterfront. They're going to be building 10 to 15,000 new units, residential units along the water. Currently, there are over 12,000 residents within a quarter mile of the ferry stop. So even if you're walking, let alone taking your bike or a scooter to get down there to the waterfront. So in terms of an incentive, the locals all want this. Right now, with that transit, it is 75 minutes to go five miles downtown. You're having to own a car and drive downtown and pay for parking and the cost for that. And if you have a young child at home, you're spending an extra hour a day on the road away from your child and paying for childcare. So in terms of the incentives, and kind of like Micah said, these are just the natural incentives. It makes really good sense. And particularly for a number of our residents there that are able to live car free. So this is, a, you know, we're not, uh, we're, we're really a, a four P partnership. We're the nonprofit, there's a, a private sector, we're not making any money, but the private sector stepped up as a partnership and provided about $25 million worth of value to this. We have the philanthropic. We've had different foundations that have helped us out. And then the fourth P is the public sector. And in terms of our greatest challenge there, it has been the, the public sector. Um, talking about the infrastructure bill, typically there is an annual passenger ferry fund through the Federal Transportation Administration it averages about $40 million a year. Right now, with the infrastructure bill, it's $300 million a year just for green passenger ferries. That money is there, but our impediment is the status quo and changing things here. We shouldn't be doing this as a little nonprofit grassroots effort. It should be a public transit agency, either PBOT or TriMet doing this. So as a grassroots effort, we're saying the status quo isn't working for us. Buying more buses, and particularly diesel buses, is not okay for us. TriMet, big fan of them, they need to be successful. They have a fleet of 700 buses, 10 of those are electrified. That is, and of that percentage, on average, um, nationally, 2.5 of bus fleets are electrified. TriMets is under half of that. That right there is unconscionable. And so there's a lot of fanfare when we go out and we purchase, our TriMet purchases new buses, and, and if they're electrified. But we're also not often hearing the story about the diesel buses. And those typically have a lifespan of 20 to 30 years. Not okay. So that's why, you know, we have to use our voices and, and step up and say, hey, we need new, better, green transit solutions. So the next question is a really important question, the question of justice. Now, how do you address the question of justice um, in this transition to renewable energy? And you're dealing with very different communities, different groups. Um, how do we ensure access? And which are the areas or communities that you need to pay attention to that may be disadvantaged in terms of being provided that access? Uh, Susan, would you like to start? You know, this is an area that we're continuing to learn about, but when we 
started this, those four public transit agencies all said, here are the 10 different ferry stop locations. We didn't make it up. It's not based on, oh, I love this town and we should have a stop here. It's where there was the greatest need and the greatest demand. Part of that need was looking at disadvantaged and marginalized communities. Um, I would say, and I would just give you my two cents worth, it's a buzzword and a buzz term right now. A lot of folks are checking the box saying, oh great, we're serving this community. But I think it's incumbent on all of us as citizens really to dig in and say who really is being served. And when it comes to environmental justice, this is beyond it being just a buzz phrase. There's been a lot of greenwashing, and I'm now saying I think there's a lot of BIPOC washing going on out there. Um, I had coffee this morning with the president of the NAACP Portland branch this morning, and he's asking me that question. Senator Lou Frederick, six years ago, asked me about that as he's representing North Portland and saying, what are you going to do to serve my constituents? And specifically, what are you going to do to help solve a lot of their respiratory illnesses? Because my constituency has the worst air quality in the state of Oregon. So for us, rather than saying, hey, how do we start a ferry service? We started off with a community benefit plan. It was particularly um, in partnership with Sunrise PDX, um, a youth climate organization that stepped in early on and said, here's how we define equity. Here's how we define inclusion. Um, and we do have a history of um, transportation apartheid on the North Portland area um, with I-5 running through the community and uh, I-5 is off to the east, and we have a Superfund site on our river off to the west, and then we have Portland International Raceway, you know, that right there, just looking at those races and the, the diesel leaded fuel that's running up there and the air pollution, and who's paying the price? It's those citizens of North Portland. So it's why we have prioritized and started Frog Ferry in that community. And I think the last thing I'd say is just looking at their transit service, the two uh, neighborhood association leaders everybody on the neighborhood association, but particularly their chairs, say, we have no public transit service. And TriMet, and again, I want TriMet to do really, really well. We would really want to have an awesome TriMet in order to connect people to and from those, um, those ferry stops. Um, but they've just announced they're cutting service. So the one line that is there with not great service, they're cutting back. That is one of the most disadvantaged, underserved communities in our metro area. You have nearly half of the population identifies as non-white. I think it's about 23% are living below the poverty line. So please, as you are advocating and using your voice, please dive in and when you talk about justice, truly what are and who are the communities that are being served. Don't just let it be at a check the box, yeah, we're serving a marginalized BIPOC community. In contrast to Susan's look at local, the local scale of inequity within Portland, uh, a lot of my work was done at the international scale and looking at inequities between the global north, which are typically white western countries uh, with a lot of wealth, versus the global south, which are these developing countries. Um, typically, these are post-colonial uh, post -colonial countries. And so I think that's a very interesting part about this panel is that we can look at, at equity at these different scales, right? There's injustice occurring at every level. And at the international scale, many of these previously colonized countries continue to lose out to these major global power players. Uh, in, the, in looking at deep seabed mining and in the transition to renewable energy, most of the developing nations were supposed to be granted a portion of the benefit from deep seabed mining. So under the treaty that governs international waters, there's a principle called the common heritage to mankind principle, and that guarantees that the benefits are equally split between all member countries. Uh, with a private actor, uh, the one that I described earlier, the, the metals company, their, their 
they are not under that same obligation. They get to keep all of their, their own profit, right? It's not being split between the countries who need it most. This, these resources were designated for developing nations in order to help them get a leg up in a global system that has consistently underserved them. This, this is part of, part of the injustice at the international scale that seems lofty and seems heavy, but it still it occurs on a daily basis and affects these people's lives. This, these are the communities that Micah is working within. Um, and so as we, as we look to develop renewable energy technologies, so much of that infrastructure exists in the global north. So even once we have these electric vehicle batteries developed and these solar panel developed, most of that will go to be serving Global North, the highest consumers. And so work like MICA is doing in these communities is so important because as, as Joe sees it and as we electrify, we're going, we're going to need to electrify the, the entire global system. It can't just be the United States. And so looking at increasing the infrastructure in developing nations to support a decarbonized global system um, is, is crucial to this movement. But that's, that's just looking at it from, from more of this global scale. And I'm sure Michael will have more, more comments on, on that. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, looking at, at access to resources worldwide, inequity is very obvious. Um, a couple of quick stats, 2.2 billion people live without access to safely uh, managed drinking water, which is more than one in four people in the world do not have safely managed drinking water. Um, many of those people don't, you know, are, are still collecting surface water, are, are walking to haul surface water. Um, and energy-wise, oh, one additional stat that I think really drives that home is that the United Nations says that in order to meet their their goals for 2030, we would have to be working six times as fast as we are to increase access to water. So there is a big gap to fill in that area. Um, in energy, we have done much, much better as a um, global eco ecosystem. We have about 675 million people living without access to electricity, um, but sadly, progress in that area has slowed over the last decade. Um, that's due to COVID-19 and also due to the fact that it is so hard to get to the people who are hardest to reach to kind of bridge that last gap, which is really what green empowerment's expertise is getting to places that are um, geographically much harder to get to. Um, also, kind of contradictory, Contradicting that fact is that um, international finance for energy projects has decreased steadily since 2017. And their, the UN's latest report just came out and it did decrease in their latest cycle as well. So there is a lot of work to do. And um, <clears throat> thank you so much for saying money in the list of constraints. It is the big constraint in our work as well. Um, so, so what can be done? Um, a big thing that green empowerment has been based on since the beginning and that we really believe in is directing finances towards in-country organizations so that they can lead development in their own countries. And I really appreciate the way that Susan framed looking at this question. You know, um, international development always sounds good. It always sounds good to bring an energy system to a community in a remote area, but it, it does take deeper investigation on how that work is being done. There's been a lot of missteps in inter international development. There are a lot of failed projects. There are a lot of projects that have left communities worse than they were when the, when the project started. We see in our work all the time working with communities that have not one, but two failed water systems that were installed before, but didn't have that community leadership to, to carry the project forward after the NGO or the government agency left. Um, so we really believe in working with these local organizations, working with the people themselves who are going to um, be using the infrastructure and really giving the power back to them to be the leaders of their own development. Um, and then I would say um, 
our obligation as an organization is to try to find more funding. It's a huge constraint on our work is, um, you know, we're grant dependent, we're individual donation dependent, and there's only so much work we can do with that small pot of money in the greater global scheme. So as we look at how to scale and how to do more, the question really is like, where will the financing come from? Things we're looking at that are imperfect are um, trying to do larger scale projects and get investments. Um, also looking at the um, voluntary carbon credit market. I'm super interested, where's Professor Kleiss? What was the decision after the game? Can, can, the, can the current system <laughs> provide a solution? <laughs> We're, we are literally having that conversation at Green Empowerment right now, so it's really exciting to hear that you guys are also talking about it. It's such an imperfect system, but it also is a place where there is finance that could be used. So um, is it worth it to do that, given the imperfections? Um, and I would say, uh, for you, as, as people at the beginning of your careers, as um, people like us who are lucky to live in the United States of America and probably will be working for the United States dollar, um, the dollar is very powerful around the globe. What we can do for communities across the globe with with our earnings, even if you feel like you're not making very much, which you won't be in the beginning. Um, it's really amazing what can be done on, in international work with small amount, with small donations. You know, find, find organizations that you believe in, that you think are doing this work the right way, and support them through becoming an employee, through internships, through donations. Um, I think that that really matters and that um, a big shift of resources from the global north that has been extractive historically um, back to countries where a lot of this wealth actually came from is needed in order to solve global inequality and also in order for the whole world to be able to step into a renewable energy future. Great, thanks for those great answers. I think um, every technology um, that's gonna be part of the solution and, and every approach has to center equity um, in, 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 this, in this revolution. Um, we, uh, I'll just maybe highlight the technology that I spend most of my time on, this water heater, no, uh, that nobody really thinks about their water heater except for dorks like me. Um, <laughs> but there's a huge equity angle to uh, this water heater market transformation. Um, uh, for example, the heat pump water heaters are three to five times more efficient. They're like the LED light bulb of water heaters. and the, um, so we have, with this initiative that I work on, we have an equity-focused uh, working group, and, and we looked at uh, what are some of the benefits for disadvantaged communities uh, for this water heater, and we saw that you know, families can typically save between three and $500 a year on this water heater uh, by installing this water heater and still taking all the hot showers that anyone needs to take. And three to $500 is you know, 15 to 20% of, uh, of the, uh, of an average home's utility bills. So that's a lot of money um, for, uh, uh, for disadvantaged communities. Uh, and other, under, other benefits uh, that Susan was talking about, pollution reduction. Water heaters actually put a lot of pollution out their, uh, uh, out, out their bee vents, out, out their pipes um, to the outside, so much so that California is thinking of regulating them and not allowing combustion water heaters. And, and then an important one, I think, with a lot of these technologies is um, uh, in the initial phase when technologies cost a little, uh, are more expensive, the early adopters are usually wealthy individuals, wealthy nations. Um, and the, uh, the risk there is that as the systems transition, as we transition to electric, clean, decarbonized uh, systems powering our homes and transportation, that uh, disadvantaged communities will be the last ones to transition. And so, for example, if you still have a gas water heater and everybody else is going to, to heat pump and the gas system has very few people you know, connected to it anymore, there's a real risk that those people left over will pay a lot more money to be for their gas. So, uh, so future-proofing disadvantaged communities is a big part, a, a big benefit uh, of, uh, of transitioning to this technology. Um, but barriers exist, and 
uh, usually barriers to decarbonization technologies are upfront costs. Um, how can you afford that? Um, and the, but there's good news on that. There's innovative programs, and, and this working group has looked at some of the innovative programs that help people uh, overcome that upfront cost, and not just the people that can afford it. And I'll just highlight one. Efficiency Maine is one of the greatest states. Uh, Maine is one of the greatest states for these decarbonizing technologies. So if you if you hear that they don't work in cold climates, Maine uh, is proof uh, uh, otherwise. And so they're, they're adopting heat pump water heaters and heat pumps at higher rates per capita than anywhere in the country. And they so they're, they're doing that for the general population, but also for disadvantaged communities at the same time. They have uh, just speaking of their water heater program, they have the best heat pump water heater program in the country where they, uh, they install heat pump water heaters in disadvantaged communities for no cost at all. And so people get to save three to five hundred dollars a year uh, um, just off uh, with this technology, not having to do anything. And so we need to replicate, we need to see what are the best examples um, where disadvantaged communities are prioritized in, uh, in this market transformation, and we need to replicate those. All right, great, thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I'd like to pose you the last question, perhaps, uh, which is, if you could change one thing, what would, it be, what would it be for each of you? And if you could succinctly say, within about a minute or so, what is that one thing we'd like to change in your field of work? What would that be? And then what I'd like to do is to open the floor for question and answers. And we'll have that ready, uh, please, uh, once we go through uh, the panelists one last time. Yes, would you like to start, Joe? Okay. Um, all right. If I were to change one thing, and, and this, the theme of tonight is on capitalism, it would be that we, uh, that we act like uh, better capitalists, and we uh, put a price on on pollution. For for years, we've been uh, <laughs> we've been treating our biosphere like a, a communal dumping ground, and and making future sticking the bill to future generations. Um, so. Uh, put, uh, putting a, a price on, on pollution would be uh, my, my wish. I'll just, uh, but I will not end on that pessimistic note. I think the, uh, that's been very hard to do politically, especially in the United States, put a price on carbon pollution. But we've seen some other interesting strategies, which is like incentivize the heck out of these technologies that are going to uh, save the day. And that seems to be working well. Uh, uh, these, you know, we are seeing a lot of market transformation. So incentives are really key. And we're also seeing lots of regulation phasing out um, polluting technologies. And so we are seeing both the carrot incentives and the stick in regulation. Awesome. I vote for that one. <laughs> um, I'm going to double down. I'd say um, I would like to see funders and government agencies getting more money to local small organizations in um, uh, low and middle income countries. Um, there actually is a movement in this direction now. Um, USAID over the last few years has been really pushing for, you may have learned about it in your classes, localization. Um, so I'd say like this is something that is starting to happen and we need to push for much, much more of it. Um, yeah, thanks so much. In in deep seabed mining, as well as facing environmental challenges on the whole, I would really like to see an increased inclusion of indigenous indigenous cultures worldwide, as well as Native Americans within the states, because these these are the people that are like these these projects are truly going to affect, and these are these are the people who understand the grander connections between ourselves and the environment and understand what long-term consequences look like, right? Capitalism, I feel like so often we look, we're so short-sighted, we want that instant gratification and we forget that these short-term decisions have long-term consequences and including a, a wider variety of perspective and including diverse perspectives will help us make help us avoid those future those future errors so that's really what i'd like to see that was beautiful olivia thank you i wish we were ending on her um, mine is far more crass 
I think that um, those that are really innovating in this space should have access to infrastructure funds, to the big federal dollars. We can't apply as a nonprofit. We have to go through a local public agency. So right now, this status quo pipeline of awesome, there's 10 times as much money, there's 100 times as much money, but it's still going to the same, it's called direct recipients, it's still the same process and pipeline. And so really trying to change that. I mean, I have written directly to Pete Buttigieg and um, Clarence, I think, um, edited my letter to him even. But um, that's got to change in the pipeline for all of this. And, um, and just to give you kind of a, a sense for the scale on this, I've had a, the president of a major sports apparel company here say, just go ahead and privatize this. And I said, we've got that pro forma. And, if peop and I said, well, the ticket prices are going to be about $14 to $23, $24. And he's like, that's okay. People will pay for it. Right there, there's that equity message. Mm -hmm. Guess what else? And keep it in mind, this is on tape. So there may be folks from TriMet that see it. We heard last Friday from the chair of the TriMet board. And he said, Go get your ferry started, do that privately, and then once you've done that, we'll see if we can integrate you into the TriMet system. So it's that kind of thinking. You would never say TriMet, go privately raise the money to add a new bus line or a new light rail line. But we have said from the get-go, honestly, it'd be easier for us to privatize this. But the ethos behind this is what is in the best service to the overall community here. And that's why, again, all of you using your voices and telling your friends, we have to show up. And that was the advice we were given today. Pack the TriMet board meetings. Turn out to city council. We had more testimony today. We had four of us there two weeks ago. We absolutely have to be relentless um, to be part of that change. If we could change one thing, but to get us there, it means we've all got to be united and activists. All right, so we have two microphones, one on the side and one on the other side. So if you have a question to the panel in general or to one or two of our, our panelists, uh, we'd like to welcome it now. Thanks, yeah. Um, Joe, this one's for you. I'm curious uh, how you move from electrifying all these spaces to being sure that they're actually powered by renewable energy. Because I know that that becomes a huge concern that you get a re um, electric car and you plug it in, but your house is still powered by natural gas. Like, there's still emissions. That's totally a, a, a valid concern. And I think um, we have to make sure that renewable energy is uh, is increasing at a breakneck speed. And the good news is it it has been. We've, uh, since uh, emissions from electricity, elect the electric power sector was the biggest source of carbon emissions uh, in the United States until just a couple years ago when transportation passed that. And since 2007, emissions have fallen 40%. That's crazy. Uh, you know, I'm 50, uh, how many years since 2007? 16 years, uh, you know, emissions have dropped by, by 40%. And we're seeing, uh, massive growth in, 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 in wind and solar. It's almost like a, a really too good to be true story. We're like, yes, the, the, the power sector is decarbonizing just as we need to electrify everything. Now, do we still need to coal, close coal plants, natural gas plants as quickly as possible? Yes. Uh, but luckily, the market trends are pointing in a really positive direction. Uh, hello. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, my question is for Ms. Bladholm. Uh, I was really wondering what the advantages of ferries specifically are for a uh, transit in a area. I've never. It's just that it sounds super cool. It's like what what would um, if you're pitching this to TriMet, say, what would be the advantage of a ferry over extending like another Max line? Well, for one. Just the river itself, you don't have the impediments of other congestion and in terms of on-time reliability, which is 
typically one of the top factors of whether or not a transit system is really efficient and successful is, is called um, operational readiness rate and on-time reliability. Ferries have 98, 99% on-time reliability. So that's one of them. Another one is just transit time itself. So right now, if you've got a commute um, by road of 75 minutes, by ferry it's 25 minutes. So right there, that's a time and a cost savings. And then the cost per passenger seat itself, so when you think about a subsidy, um, on average, a TriMet seat, these are pre-COVID numbers, so I'm sure the cost is higher now. Um, it's not TriMet's fault. We've got overall transit numbers are down, unfortunately, nationally, even though our congestion you know, is up since pre-COVID here in the metropolitan area. But um, you'll buy a $2.50 ticket, but the actual cost for that ride is about $20. So that subsidy is $17.50. By ferry, it's $2.50. So one-seventh the cost. So both from an infrastructure perspective, um, time and cost, and then also um, looking at the overall operational cost. And, and, and I think the last thing that if we had our supporters here that have been out on multiple river runs, there is just a pure joy and magic to being out on the river and really to help foster a greater sense of stewardship of our rivers, which is often viewed as an impediment and an obstacle to get around or over rather than truly being embedded in the fabric of our culture here as a river city. Hi. Um, oh, wow. Um, my question is for Susan as well. Um, I wanted to know, so with TriMet's um, hesitation to actually adopt ferries, how much when you, if ideally we get to pass it over to them or if they take this project on, how much do you trust them to do it well? Well, uh, we started with them six and a half years ago. So I, you know, I've been in the transit community here in economic development for over 35 years. So we knew, let's start with you and have you lead it. And they have said, we want nothing to do with this. We do not run ferries. So, you know, throughout we've said, hey, if any public agency wants to take this on, we'll happily turn this over. We just want to see it happen. Um, our model is public transit. There's no money to be made in, in this. Um, I haven't been paid for four of the six years I've worked on it. Um, this is truly a labor of love and um, really the volunteer group. So no one has been paid on our team for over two years. In terms of TriMet taking it on, they're, they're refusing to do so. I, if, if they did, honestly, I would say great and I think the public would embrace it and I think they would have some happy pressure to do really well with it. It's a pretty simple transit operation. It's not that complex. It's the, akin to putting a bus on a water roadway and you're building out bus stops for the docks. And seven of our 10 dock locations are, already exist. So we're using infrastructure that's already there and underutilized. So yeah, if they were to step up any way, shape, or form, I would be their number one fan and champion. I'll, we'll take all the help we can get. We just want to make it happen for our community. Hi, um, I have a question for Olivia. What advice would you give to any undergraduates starting out in the ENVS major here at Lewis and Clark? I think my greatest, especially pertaining to environmental studies majors, although my presentation today may not have showcased that, is to maintain a sense of optimism. I think these <laughs> experts in the field really really highlight that the best that it can is that despite looking at the world through these international challenges, it can get very overwhelming because it, it is all interconnected. So find something that you're passionate about and stay optimistic that that, that challenge or that goal that you have, some part of it can be achieved. We're never, I think Susan said this perfectly earlier, is there'll never be a perfect solution, 
but things can get better. And so when you're passionate about something, let that passion take you through that and let that allow you to, to stay optimistic because it is, it is daunting and it's a terrible world to talk about all of these issues throughout all of your classes here. Um, but just maintain that sense of hope and understand that, that things can be better. So that's what I would say. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, I first want to say I admire Joe for your passion of water heaters. <laughs> Secondly, I am uh, the Brownfield Revitalization Coordinator for a company called Neek Engineering, and I go through a lot of red tape and bureaucratic horridness just in Portland trying to get funding and grants for my company to revitalize um, hazardous properties. I was curious for those of you that are working with international communities on how that plays a part in like the, the natural resource trap that dictators and non-democratic countries will face when you are trying to implement, implement um, like more eco-friendly practices in that country. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, great question, thank you. Um, kind of goes back to what the, the theme I've been hounding all night, being working with, working very local, right? So um, I gave the example of in Malaysia, we are working with the Sabah government who is ready and interested and that is a place in the world where we work where there is interest and collaboration with the government. Um, there are also places where we work where there is very little collaboration with the government. Currently in Nicaragua and in Ecuador, we're seeing very little collaboration from the government, working ma mainly there on water access projects. And in that case, you know, it is a question of staying optimistic, as Olivia would say, because um, in an ideal world, the government would be involved with these projects. It is one of the main ways to see sustainability over time is to have government support as soon as Susan is saying, right? Those are the people who actually have access to the big resources. Um, and hopefully in a stable country who will be there for decades to come to maintain systems. But it is not the reality everywhere that there are governments who have, who have the resources, who are not corrupt um, and who are able um, are interested in being in, being involved in development in these remote communities. So um, I'd give an example of in Ecuador, we're working with this incredible community who's on a river system actually in the Rio Cayapas, which is in the Esmeraldas province of Ecuador, um, one of the poorest regions of the country. Um, and you know, the work we're doing there, we're doing largely without the government. We are working with this local nonprofit. So we are a nonprofit from the United States. We're working with a local nonprofit called Al Tropico, which is an Ecuadorian, what is their equivalent of a nonprofit there. And then we are going directly to communities, to small, small towns and talking to the, the president of the community and working with them and saying, do you want this? What is your community organized in that? Like, is your community organized that they would be able to do this collectively? Do they want it? and starting that process on this very local level. Um, something I didn't get to say that I wanted to bring up tonight was just that in our sector, there is a lot of pressure right now for solutions to be market-driven solutions. And I would say like, I wanna put a vote in for community-driven solutions. Um, working on the local level and really working with community ownership, we have seen in our work that that can be very sustainable over time as well. Um, I was wondering what you all are reading right now, and especially in regards to like local Portland like issues. I think like as someone who just goes to school on the hill here, like it's hard to like get in there and like really have a genuine like consume genuine local perspectives. So, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Was the question what are we reading right now? I 
actually on my Facebook post right now. It's called um, Canopy of Titans, and it's by um, Paul Kloberstein and Jessica Alp Applegate. And it is about the Cascadian rainforest. So here from um, Alaska all the way down to the Redwood Forest, the, that's the largest forest of carbon sequestration in the world. So it's now larger than the Amazon, and it's right here in our backyard. And, um, and so just looking at our old growth stands and the fact that half of their weight is in carbon sequestration. So there's no other um, machine or technology out there that's helping um, with carbon um, outside of these old growth stands that we really need to protect. And they're in our backyard. So and it's, it's a fascinating read. So pick it up, or you can email me, and I'll send you my copy when I'm done. I'll, I'll just add, um, I, I'm a public radio and news junkie, but uh, I think today there was an article on um, on how natural gas companies were using uh, similar tactics to cigarette companies to downplay the risks of burning natural gas in the home uh, for cooking and like denying the science and um, and calling into question the, uh, the 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 many studies on this so it, locally there's a and across the nation but especially on the on the west coast there's a big movement to um, to not allow natural gas in, in new buildings. And, and so we're seeing a lot of, uh, uh, Eugene was the first city to pass uh, an ordinance um, banning gas in new buildings. And, and Portland's been thinking about it. Milwaukee, south of Portland, has, has been thinking about it. So lots lots to cover those, or lots, lots being covered in the gas wars, as, the, as they're called. So. All right. Uh, perhaps it is time for us to ask Clarence to come forward and give us his wisdom, uh, trying to summarize, conclude, perhaps ask more questions. Um, so please. Can I sit here? Yeah. Sure. This was really interesting. And why don't we have a round of applause for this uh, really interesting panel this evening? <laughs> You know, while I was sitting here listening, I was thinking to myself, it's, it's really exciting and interesting to hear all the different levels um, of action that are going on in the energy and the clean energy transition around the world, from Portland to Nauru to Malaysia. It's actually happening, and this is exciting for, you know, I have usually my head stuck in a book or, you know, not a book, I don't get to read that much, but I'll have my head stuck in an email from work and you know it, it, it gets very removed in Washington DC so it's cool to hear this something that came to mind was uh, you know the energy transition in the United States needs a lot of minerals it, le it needs a lot of cobalt and manganese and lithium and it's uh, it, it, there was a theme running through this where you know the EVs that we need the electric ferries that we need the heat pumps that we need all need these minerals. They're the foundation of the clean energy economy of the, not of the future, of the present. But there's a challenge because if we, if we don't have, if we don't, if we're not careful, we're gonna end up building a clean energy economy on the backs of uh, marginalized people in this country and around the world. You know, it's, it's interesting to me to hear about environmental justice here in Portland and also climate justice um, in places like Nauru. We need justice because if we don't have justice, then all we're going to do is replicate a clean version of the fossil fuel industry that we have today. So that's, that was a strong theme in my mind coming through this. Uh, listening to this panel. Um, how do we ensure that communities and people are not left behind? You know, that's the other challenge. Here in North Portland, what uh, Susan is talking about, that, you know, Frog Ferry is something that will benefit that community too. But how do we make sure that 
North Portland or the indigenous communities in uh, Malaysia um, or in Ecuador and the people of Nauru? How do we make sure that they're not left behind in this transition? That's something that you know, some of you have asked me, how can we get involved? What can I do in this transition? There's a, there's a lot of room for advocacy around equity and justice for people around the world. And so that's, that's a really interesting area to get into. Um, some of the other things, you know, I talked last night about vulture capitalism and Nauru, but you were telling me earlier about the company making billions of dollars and Nauru gets like $750 million, which, I mean, I would take $750 million. <laughs> But if you're a country that are giving away your natural resources, is that fair? And once again, we have to be sure that we don't build a clean energy economy on the backs of the poor. This is another industrial revolution. A lot of the poverty and injustice that came out of the first industrial revolution, um, we, can, we can make sure that we don't do that for this industrial revolution. This is an opportunity for everyone to for everyone to be good capitalists and get rich and do good at the same time. It was really interesting to hear the international angle and in talking about the global north and the global south. We and the rich industrialized nations have a responsibility um, to the global south, where these resources will come from. Um, back in 2015 or so at the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, Western industrialized countries pledged $100 billion a year for the energy transition in developing countries. We have not lived up to that promise and to that pledge, and that's something that still needs to be followed through with. Um, last couple of things. Um, you know, we need better governance. We were talking about international law. Uh, we need effective international law right now. So on the global level, we need international law. Locally, we need effective uh, governance. We need better than TriMet. I've known Susan for a few years. I've, I've listened to her struggles with TriMet. The energy transition needs municipal governments and regulatory agencies that listen to innovators and that will respond to new dynamic ways of doing things. And I love Portland. Portland's government ain't cutting it. You know, it's just, whether it's TriMet or whether it's the city council, this city should be a leader in the clean energy transition. This city that is always about keeping it weird and doing things differently, here's your chance to do something weird and different. Be effective, um, be a leader in the clean energy transition. This is a great time for Portland. And you all are here as students, maybe some of you as residents. This is a great, petri dish for pushing the clean energy economy and the clean energy future forward. So those are some of the thoughts that I had tonight. Energy for more. Our final event will be tomorrow. That is our waste art workshop. Yes, put those words together. Hands on, discuss commodity flows and their ultimate destinations with friends inspired by art. We hope to see you there. And thanks again to all of our participants and to all of our student co-chairs and coordinators. Good night.